I heard this this story this past week that I thought was was absolutely brilliant. It's uh, and it actually kind of fits what we're going to talk about this morning. But it, last week in South Carolina, there was this the school bus driver, and he's you know mind his own business driving a school bus, and he's got a bunch of these elementary school age kids. That's going to be important, right? So kindergarten up to grade five sort of thing. So he's got all these kids sitting with him and and behind him, and he he all of a sudden pulls up to a stop sign, I guess, and this man with a a rifle you know, bursts onto the bus and, and he's a, an army recruit and he's basically, he's hijacked this bus and all the kids are on it and everything. And he wants to be, you know, the bus driver to take him to the next town. And so you can just imagine the stress and the anxiety that everyone's got, but you know, the bus driver kept it calm and he's, yes, sir. Okay. You know, everything will be fine. And he starts driving. Well, then the kids start asking questions and, and you know how kids are, right? Are, are you a soldier? Are you going to hurt us? Are you going to hurt our bus driver? Where are we going? How long are we going to get there for? Well, after about five minutes of this, he says, enough. Like, he, he kind of felt this sense of, they're just going to bombard me with all kinds of questions. So he, he just kicked everyone off the bus. So I kind of thought it was funny that, that here are all those questions. And if, if you're, you know, a parent of little kids or had little kids, you know what that's like. Are we there yet? How much longer? I have to go to the bathroom. And so you can just imagine this guy going, oh, no more, no more. Kicks them all off the bus. So... I thought that's a funny story because what we're going to talk about this morning is parenting. We've uh, we've come to for the first time the final chapter in Ephesians, chapter six, and and it opens up with this this passage on parenting, and uh, so I thought that was appropriate. So what we're going to look at though is you know last time we talked about marriage and we talked about how marriage is the is really the hardest the hardest relationship in the world, and and that's because you have these two individuals who are coming together. And are now one, and and I think parenting though is the hardest job in the whole world, uh, and and it's part because it's just such an awesome responsibility. I still remember, you know, the, when we we brought Hannah home from the hospital for the very first time, that moment where where I'm walking out, you know, Hannah's all strapped up, completely safe in this this you know car seat, and I'm carrying her, and I'm I'm just petrified here with this idea that. They're letting Joy and I walk out with this baby. Like, if they were smart, they would have tackled us. They would have said no, because you're just like terrified with the responsibility of what you're coming up with, right? So that's part of what makes it so hard, because of the awesome responsibility. But another part of it, I think, is just, it's relentless. Every day, it's just it's just ongoing, and it's, it's, it's not simple. And, you know, you get to the end of the day, and guess what? You wake up, and it starts all over again. And, and so that's part of it. And then, then you have Genesis chapter three, where, where God talks about, the, you know, when he, when he after the, the, the fall of Adam and Eve, he talks about the curse. He says to the woman about increasing her, her pain in childbearing. And I, I got to think that's more than just the labor and delivery. Because every, every woman I've, sp- I've spoken to, as hard as labor and delivery is, you know, raising those kids is much harder. Because that's 18 plus years. And, and again, that relentless relentless coming at you. And then then you got even more trouble because you know children they're not they're not little adults. They don't they don't think logically. They don't they don't think rationally because their brains are still developing. And and for some, you know, it's not till age 21. And then for for John and Greg, they're still developing. And one day they'll have a developed brain, right? So there's there's all kinds of stuff going on, right? And so it can be difficult. I mean, there might be some days where you think it's easier to herd little cats around. But let's be honest, it's not easy being a kid either. And I think as parents, we sometimes forget that, you know? It's it's hard to be under someone else's authority and not always understanding why things are the way they are and why things have to go that way. And so you start to feel a bit powerless. And and then there's all the questions you have. You know, who am I? And and what's my purpose? And, and where do I fit? And, and then the struggles with insecurity and shame and hormones and puberty and, and talking about the, op, you know, with the opposite sex and who likes you and who do you like and what career are you going to pick? And there's so many questions that, that we struggle with. And, and then there's the questions that we don't even realize we have. We, we can't even articulate those questions, which means you have no hope of even answering those questions. So it's, it's not easy to be a parent and it's not easy being a child. Both, both are hard work to grow up in, but but it's a worthy adventure. It is, it, it, despite the pain, despite the difficulty, it is 
it is worth the joy and the reward of watching these little humans grow up, watching them find out who they are and come into their own and, and let that personality shine. And, and as parents, it's really exciting to, to get to know the unique child and get to know what they're like, but also to just to, to rediscover this world through those childlike eyes, the, the joy and, and the innocence when they discover something new. It's, it's really, really cool. And quite frankly, it can help us mature along the way as well. So, so it's, it's an awesome responsibility, but it's an awesome opportunity as well. Now, before we get into the passage and into this topic of parenting, I, I do want to start with a word of caution because, you know, especially for you parents, I know how the enemy is going to work here, how the enemy is going to take what I say and twist it into some kind of a shame or condemning thought and try to drag you down and, and leaving you with this shame and this despair and the sense of failure. And I want you to know every one of those thoughts is not coming from God, not one. God will never shame us. He will never condemn us. He never leads us into despair. Romans 8, 1, right? There is not yet one single condemnation for those who are us, us in Christ Jesus. And so we got to always keep at the forefront of our mind, always remember everything else we've been learning through this book of Ephesians and, and really through it, all the New Testament about who we are in Jesus, that we are loved and we are completely accepted and, and not because of what we've done, but solely because of what Jesus has done on the cross. That's what makes us okay. That's what makes us safe. That we're not under this law of performing, of trying to measure up to be good enough parents, but under grace. It's all because of what Jesus has done. So we, we don't have to get on this treadmill of trying to be good parents to silence the voice of shame because it will never work anyways. And so let me, let, let me in on a little secret here. And, and especially for you little kids. So you may come a little bit closer to the screen here. A, a little closer. Mm, little, that's uh, too close. We, remember, we're still under COVID, right? Social distancing here, but your parents aren't perfect. You know, Caleb, I know it's going to shock you. Mama's not perfect. Daddy, even daddy's not perfect, right? And and so we're all failing and we all will fail more. And, and, and we've all failed lots of times as parents. That's true of every one of us. No one lives this thing out perfectly. Instead, what we want to do in looking at this topic is we want to discover what does it mean as these new creations in Christ? What do we now as parents get to offer our kids? And as kids, what do we get to offer our parents so that we can share this life? We can share this love of, of God that he he's lavished upon us. And, and for those of you who, who are, you know, kids are all grown up and maybe have their own kids, you know, at this point. You know, the summers and the beavers and so forth. Now, listen, you guys, it's not too late. You still get to, to love on your kids and, and you still get to, to be there for them now as their their parents and themselves, but you also got these little beautiful grandchildren as well. And and if you're thinking, but, you know, they've, you know, my kids are off the rails or my grandkids are off the rails, just remember this as well. Our God specializes in redemption and the story is far from over. All right? So keep that in mind. No condemnation. We're not here to judge anyone, not going to tear anyone down. Instead, we're going to discover life, life that God has for us. So let's read our passage, and then we're going to pray. So Ephesians chapter 6, and verse, verse 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents. We should stop right there, but we won't. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wisdom that you're gonna you know, hopefully share with us this morning as we discover what it means to, to have parents and how we interact with them, but also as parents and how we can love our kids and, and, uh, and raise them up in a way that, that you've designed things. And again, we recognize we have an enemy who's going to try to shame us. We know that. He's going to try to twist and distort your words, your good news, as a way to try to make us feel less than and inferior and inadequate. And so would you in that moment, Father, would you, in a very special, very real way, put your armor on our shoulders around us and just remind us that, that we're loved and it's okay and that you're working. You're working in us and you're working in our children. And so therefore, 
we have hope. So we're looking forward to what you want to share with us today. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're going we're gonna to start with the children first. We're going to start with, with what Paul's saying to them. And we'll make it brief because chances are most of the kids are either falling asleep at this point or already kind of run out of the room. But, um, but again, we said earlier, parents are not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. They've made lots of mistakes. They're not perfect, but generally they do love you. And they're do, they are looking to help you. They are generally trying to do what's in your best interest. And, and I know it doesn't always feel that way, right? It, it feels that sometimes they're just out there to punish and make you suffer. But I, I guarantee I don't know the single parent that didn't think, hey, let's have kids because that way I have someone to torture and abuse. They didn't start out that way, right? And that doesn't mean that you haven't been hurt by them. It doesn't mean that you haven't been abused by them. And, and just because they're not perfect, it doesn't make that abuse okay. Far from it. What you've gone through and what you've experienced isn't okay. It's not right. Uh, despite the fact that they've done their best, you've still been hurt. And, and chances are it's because out of their own hurt, they've hurt you. And again, that doesn't make it right, but it helps us hopefully to have some compassion towards these imperfect people who aren't living it out perfectly. But keep in mind, though, right, that they, they do have some wisdom. They do have some insight, which is why we're to honor, why we are to listen to them. I, I like to think of it this way. You don't reach peak intelligence as a 15-year-old, as a teenager, right? It's not like your parents were, were really, really smart at age 17, and they've been getting dumber ever since. But you, you're right there. You're, you know better than them. Uh, no, it doesn't quite work that way. And, and yes, culture's changed and times have changed, but people are people. This world is still this world, and they've got some insight. They've got some wisdom. They know what it's like to be a teenager, and so they will every so often have a pearl of wisdom, and so it's it's right, and it's good, and it's proper for you to, li to listen to them. Hence this idea that you will live long, that, that you will live a, a more content, a more full life. Chances are, if you can learn from the wisdom of your parents, and as Pastor Robin spoke about last time, it's right that we honor those who are in authority. You know, and that's including, and I think especially our parents, that we honor and listen to them. And, and then if all else fails, I know some really good counselors. Give them a call. We'll help you out. We'll kind of we'll put things back together again, right? Because there's always hope. Again, as I said earlier, God specializes in redemption. All right, now to the parents. Ugh. All right. So we're going to start... We're going to start really looking at some pitfalls this morning and then get into some more of the practical side of it next week. Um, but I got to, you know, again, warn you, you're going to hear these pitfalls. And if you're anything like me, chances are you've experienced these pitfalls firsthand as a parent and have failed many times and will fail many more times as well going down these roads. But, but number one, the first one is that we often be guilty with if not dealing with our own stuff. Right? What I mean by it is ignoring the baggage, the shame, the hurt that we've been carrying with us ever since we've grown up. And because we, we don't deal with it, what ends up happening is we kind of pass it off and hand it to our kids. And, and so our children now, they, they kind of become recipients of our hurt. As that, as that famous book title, Hurt People, Hurt People. And so we as parents, again, we're not completed finished works of you know, where God's got nothing left to do in us. But if we don't deal with our hurts and our baggage, we will pass it on. I have this quote from, uh, from the book called The Cure in Parents. And it's written by, by John Lynch and Bill Thrall and, and, and others. And it's, it's a really, really great book. And I highly recommend it if you haven't read it already. Um, but he has this great quote on that, on that topic. And so he said, they, they say this, when, you're, when your children are young, being the parent carries enough control to handle them. But if you don't grow up as they grow older, your immaturity will stunt their maturity at the level of your own. And no measure of control can handle that. Parenting exposes unresolved issues. We might otherwise ignore to be per perpetually unaware of. Like it or not, those we, tend, we love tend to most reveal our unresolved issues, issues in us. An unresolved issue is, significantly, is a significantly recurring problem that increasingly affects our lives because it never gets better. 
So for example, that could be things like anger and, and despair or, or looking to escape and so forth, right? All of that comes out in this stress, in this pressure cooker that's called parenting. And it's going to come out. And so it's just constantly coming up. They go on, the quote reads, these issues embarrass us. It's so easy to cover them over and hope they go away, but they don't. And instead, they're buried alive, erupting when we are overstressed, challenged, inflamed, wronged, or insecure. So, for example, things like COVID or the lockdowns, you know, the stress at work or the stress having the kids at home while they're, they're doing online learning or you're trying to do Zoom meetings and so forth. All that added stress just inflames it, brings it to the surface. But it doesn't have to be big things. It could just be little things. I remember when Hannah was very little, she was very outgoing. She was that social butterfly. And it exposed all my personal insecurities, my personal shame. Being an introvert, I wanted to hide. And here was Hannah running around and, and hi, how are you? What's your name? What do you do? And it was terrifying as an introvert for me because it felt like I was being thrown out there. And I remember having to fight that urge to, to not stifle her outgoingness and thereby stifling her just because I was feeling in, inadequate or uncomfortable or insecure and like that. So those are things that are bringing to the surface. They go on to write, if anything is to change, we must admit that some things have happened in our lives so that, well, just shouldn't have happened. And if we've been harmed by what happened, for many, it's too costly to admit this. So we learn to limp around our wounds. Gradually, we learn to cover up or clean up the symptoms so our issues won't embarrass us. Or we try to ignore it, hoping it will just go away over time. It doesn't. Many of us can go a lifetime almost oblivious to this baggage we carry. Sadly, we may be the only ones oblivious to this. Most others can see it. Though they may, be, they may not be sure what they're seeing. Here's the deal. You know you're carrying around an unresolved issue when you are told by more than one key person in your life that you are overreacting to a situation. This overreacting is a result of wounding. You can usually trace that wounding back to three things. Your own sin, someone else's sin against you, or someone important to you consistently um, choosing not to love you. So now here, how's it, how's it plays out on our kids? Unless our wounding is identified and addressed so that it can be redeemed and healed, we will remain with an unresolved issue, stunted in our immaturity, and our children will be stunted in their immaturity by ours, with the ongoing result of our children not trusting us. Trust is developed as kids begin to believe that we have maturity not to make something about us when we need it to make it about them. And their trusting us is dependent on our trusting God with who he says we are and allowing him to redeem and heal us from our wounding and unresolved issues. Now notice, trust is not formed when we get it all together. Right? It's, it's not when you figure it out and you start acting perfectly that now you've earned their trust. But rather when you just begin to admit that you have struggles and you apologize to your kids for overreacting, for yelling at them, or for maybe for applying too harsh of a consequence. And, and, and what you're doing now is you're starting to show to them how you're turning to Jesus, how you're trusting in Jesus for help. So here's a really important thing. Don't hide your struggles from your kids. Let them see you're working things out. Now, keep in mind that a five-year-old doesn't need to see everything, right? You know, at a little age, young age, they need to know that everything's safe. They need to know that they're, they're secure, that, that mom and dad, you know, they've, they've got a little bit of knowledge that, you know, they know how to, to operate this motor vehicle called life sort of thing. So they're not petrified, staying up, up, up all night, anxious, right? No, no little child should worry about money, for example. But as they get older and as they begin to mature, start to peel back some of the curtain. Let them see some of those struggles. Let them see what you're going through, right? That, that's healthy. That's good, right? Let them see that you don't have it all together, that you're not perfect. Because otherwise what happens is they grow up thinking that you are perfect and wondering why they are not. Well, they just can't seem to measure up to mom or to dad. Mom and dad had it all together. What's wrong with me? 
Mom and dad had a perfect marriage. They never argued, what's wrong with our marriage? So what ends up happening is they fall into that trap of trying to measure up to perfection. Now, a lot of parents, they struggle with the belief, well, if I, if I tell my kids about my struggles, either my current struggles or my past when I was their age and all the stupid things I did, then they'll lose respect for me. And, and to be honest, that's not true. If anything, I think they will respect you more for being honest with them. Besides, how do they learn from your mistakes if they never know about them? So one of the things that Joy and I have done is we've told our kids they can ask us anything and we will answer. Again, at age-appropriate you know, answers, so to speak, but we'll tell them all about our stupid things. You know, what about this mistake? Did you make that mistake? What about this? What about that? And we will be honest with them. We'll be forthright with them. Does it cause us to shudder inside? Oh yeah, you bet. But uh, they have that permission because we want them to learn from our mistakes. But we also want them to know that, that we screwed up, but God forgave us. And God will be there for them when they screw up. Not if, but when. All right, the next common pitfall that parents often make is the overprotective parent, the so-called helicopter parent, right? Because you're always hovering around, protecting that child from making any mistake, from getting hurt any time. And, and I remember my first year in university learning how valuable this lesson can be of this overly protective, overly responsible parent. And so here I was in first year university and I'm living on a dorm with a, with a bunch of other, you know, guys my age all in first year and, and first year university is frosh week and frosh week is basically, uh, you start drinking on the Monday after your parents drop you off and sometime later you'll stop. Um, generally by the following Monday, hopefully, uh, but it's just a big party and going out and staying up late and, and all sorts of things. And it really is just a big party for that week. But then that following Monday, classes start and off you go. Well, the, this, this one guy in particular, he was in electrical engineering. Now, electrical engineering at the University of Waterloo, you got to be smart. You got to have, you know, you know low mid 90s in, in algebra and calculus and physics and chemistry and, and so forth. This is, you're no dummy to get into electrical engineering. So this is a smart kid. But apparently no one told him that Frosh Week ended. And so what ended up happening is he just drank and partied all of first, first semester until suddenly now it's exam time. And he's like, oh, dear, I got to study. Well, he, he couldn't cram three months of, of studying into a couple nights and, and he couldn't do it. And so he completely failed out. And back then, if you failed, it wasn't like, okay, go back to the start, try again. No, no, They're like you're done. You're out leave the program, leave the university. And, and I remember thinking that here was a kid who, who never learned to be responsible for himself. He probably at, at home was, his mom was always there. Have you done, Billy, have you done your homework? Billy, you can't go out. Make sure you're home at this time. Billy, did you study for this test? Did you do this? Did you do this project? What about this? And so mom and dad were probably always there to make sure that he, he did what he was supposed to do. So now when he had that freedom, couldn't handle it. He didn't know what to do with himself. And, and so because he couldn't handle that responsibility, when he had no one there to tell him what to do, he completely lost it. And, and so it's, it's important to understand that that failure or even getting hurt isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now, please understand, don't go so far with this. Well, you're saying we should let our kids play on the 401? Of course not, right? Obviously, you've got, you know, you make sure you protect them so they don't get hurt. But Great lessons can be learned from kid, for kids when they fail at a young age. Because think about it, those, the lessons or the outcomes are often far less costly. Think about it this way. When you're 18 and you fail, it can end up in a police record that you have for the rest of your life. It can end up in a pregnancy that you weren't expecting. It could end up in a relationship that, that you don't want. And so the mistakes that an 18, 19, 20-year-old can make are, have bigger consequences. Whereas if they can make similar mistakes in terms of, of, of finding those boundaries that they shouldn't cross when they're 8, 9, 10, the consequences generally are less. 
and easier to recover from. And so we wanted our kids to fail at a young age. Because think about it, how do you learn resilience without failure? How do, you, how do you stretch yourself if you don't go and push yourself past those limits? How do you learn to overcome rejection without experiencing it? And so you see, if we, if we attempt to shield our kids from anything bad, anything hard, anything difficult, we're actually setting them up for fail, failure. And I think we've seen that now, right? We have this generation of kids who were celebrated for everything, that they were given a gold medal just for showing up. And, and so now they're, they're reaching adulthood and they can't handle life. They can't handle rejection. They can't hand, handle a different opinion than their own. They need these safe spaces, right? They, they can't handle failure because they never learned to experience those things growing up. See, one of the things that Joy and I were, were trying to do, we're not trying to raise children. You see, in my opinion, there are too many 28-year-old children out there. We don't need those kinds of children. We need adults. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise adults, five adults who are resilient, who, who are able to trust God and are able to handle adversity and able to handle failure and keep coming back. And so what that means is Joy and I, we don't handle all their problems, especially when the problems are with their siblings or with their friends. We will send them back out. That sounds like a problem that you need to sort out with your sister or your brother. That doesn't mean we kind of leave them always off to their own, but we're not going to be those heavy guns that come in and try to solve all the issues. So my hope is really that basically by the time they, that last year that they're living under our roof, that they will be operating with full autonomy, that we don't have a curfew, we don't, we're don't we not making sure they've done their homework and so forth, that they are they're responsible. Because now they can make those mistakes under my roof and I'm there to, to, to still help them if they're in those moments, but they're practicing that responsibility. They're practicing those being an adult. All right, the next pitfall I see happening is the other extreme of that, which is the disengaged parents, right? The overly permissive. You see, the reality is, as people, we don't tend to navigate directly to balance. We, we tend to go from one extreme to the other extreme. And so either we are that, that, you know, helicopter parent or often we become that overly permissive parent where, where basically all things go. Never say no to the child and, and, and basically we become an uninvolved parent and we're failing them as a parent. A famous proverb, Proverbs 23, 24 says this, he who withholds his, his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now, I don't believe this, this, this passage is primarily talking about how you discipline your child. That you got to get, you know, the board of education on the seat of learning and, 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 and so forth. That's not what it's talking about primarily. It's just talking about the importance of discipline in all, at all. And that if, if you're trying to be that cool parent, trying to get your child to like you, first and foremost, you will fail them, right? That instead that we are told, we are taught, that we are to discipline them because we love them. Because we care about them, we're gonna say no. As little kids, we say no to them wanting to stay up all night. We say no to them having, wanting to have ice cream all the time and, and, and never have vegetables and so forth. We say that because we know what's healthy and right for them. But when they get a bit older, some of those things begin to change. And again, we're saying no, we're, we're disciplining them because that's how they learn. That's how they learn consequences to their choices. And I know that in talking with some, some adults now who grew up in that overly permissive environment, they kind of wish their parents said something. That when they stumbled home at three o'clock in the morning drunk, they wish their parents said something because it would have shown that they cared. But in trying to be that cool parent, they didn't, they didn't help anybody. And so it's important that we discipline our children. But again, we do so in a way that isn't abusive, that doesn't break their spirits. All right, the next pitfall <clears throat> is not working together as parents. Now, number one, children, they employ a divide and conquer strategy that they'll, they'll often play mom, mom and dad against each other. And this is especially the true when mom and dad are separated now, no longer living together under the same roof. And it becomes really important now to get on the same page. And please understand, I know that you, you know, mom and dad, you separated and you got a divorce because you couldn't get along anymore. 
But when it comes to those children, you got to put everything else aside. Sacri- you know, surrender your ego, surrender the hurts and so forth, and get on page together, meaning work together. Don't just keep relitigating all your hurts and pains with your spouse with one another and therefore hurting your kids. But but here's, I think, the bigger danger. And whether whether you're separated or whether you're together, here's, here's what I see a lot of parents doing is they're overcompensating for one another. So, so what happens now is you got one parent who, who becomes a bit more strict. I mean, they, they want, you know, Things will be run a certain way, on time, clean house, follow the rules, very respectful to your parents. And, and so maybe they become a little bit more on the strict, a little bit more on the, the abrupt side of things. And so now the other parent starts to try to compensate. And so they try to become a little bit more permissive, a little bit more comforting and soft, let things go a little bit, hoping to kind of balance things out and be you know in the middle that way. Except what happens to that strict parent? they become a little bit more stricter. And then that parent overcompensates and becomes a little bit more permissive and a little bit more stricter and a little bit more permissive. And now what ends up happening is you have two parents that rather than averaging out in the middle, those children are growing up with Jekyll and Hyde. They're they're growing up with these these parents that are overly strict and overly, overly permissive and and they're they're bouncing all over the place here and and it's not helping anyone. And and again, they're, they're... thinking that I'm only doing that because the other person is doing it. And the reality is if, if you, you know, maybe you're that overly strict, if you come more towards the middle, that allows the other one to become meet you there. So if you find yourself being the more strict parent, then loosen up a little bit. And that allows the permissive parent to, to be, you know, a bit more, you know, strict or vice versa. Again, the mature one's going to be the one to act first. Don't wait for the other person. You be that one to allow that person to come back in. Again, coming into that where that middle is actually will help the child more than trying to overcompensate for the other one, the other parent. All right, the next pitfall is failing to see the child as someone who's unique, someone who's different, not only from you, but also from the other, other children you have. Maybe the most famous quoted parable or sorry, proverb around parenting is Proverbs 22 and verse six, where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this verse has been quoted and used many times as a promise that, that, you know, parents, if you raise your children, uh, you know, knowing the gospel, going to church in Sunday school and so forth, then yeah, sure enough, they'll hit those teenage years and they'll go crazy right? They'll start drinking and maybe using some drugs and partying and country music and drinking Pepsi and, you know, just really off the rails sort of thing. But eventually they'll come back. Eventually they'll start coming back to God because here's the promise. You raised them right, therefore they'll be okay. I wish it was that way, but it's not. That's not what this proverb is telling us. And I think it comes down to how, how it was translated. A better translation would really be that if you train up the child in the way that they are bent, that's literally what it's saying. The way that they are created, the way they are formed, that when they get older, they will not depart from it. So what that means is we fail our children when we try to place them into a particular mold, when we want to make them into who we think they should be rather than who they were created. You, you might see this when you, when you want your child to sort of follow your footsteps and join the family business. Maybe it's a, as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a, in, as a police officer, or, or maybe you own the business. For example, John and Danielle might be looking at their kids saying, one of these kids, they're going to become cider men. They're going to take over the siding business. And maybe it's not what they want. But what happens is we try to conform them. You know, I got, I got a lot of artistic kids And the mistake would be to try to make them into engineers. Or, you know, Caleb's, he's very much like an engineer. The mistake would be to try to make him into something he's not. That's that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to discover who are these kids? What are they like? And and that's that's one of the things that we liked about homeschooling. And it's not about whether homeschooling is right or wrong or not. But what we liked about it was the opportunity to really tailor that one-on-one education to fit what they're like. So we had to get to know them. Or the likes and dislikes and their natural giftings and how do we support that now to sort of 
make them into who they're supposed to be. It, are they supposed to be a lawyer? Are they supposed to be um, uh, an engineer or an artist or whatever? How do we support that? And and again, you know, if if we as a parent, if if we're not comfortable with who we are, and and therefore we're not going to be comfortable who they might be, we're gonna we're gonna just begin to to stifle them. And the, the prom- promise pro- the problem with that is now when they get older, they're not going to be comfortable in their own skin. And eventually they will rebel against who they've tried, you've tried to make them into and wonder why, how did it work this way? All right, the next one, and this is a big one, where, where we fail to understand how while important authority is important, so is trust and influence. What I mean by that, it's right that our children understand authority. It's right they understand it's important to listen to you and so forth. But it's also really important that we understand that we have to earn their trust and we earn their influence. Because when we disregard influence and trust, we will fall back to authority. We will fall back trying to control them through rules and, 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 and trying to get them basically to earn our affection by how well they measure up to our authority. And the problem with that is these little children will grow up under this system, and they'll grow up believing that their acceptance is only conditional to them being able to perform well. Only when they're behaving right, which is really another form of legalism. And the reality is all legalism ends poorly because legalism kills. Now, understand, maybe you had good intentions, but I love what Paul says about the law. In Romans 7, verse 10, he says this about the law, the commandments. These are the Ten Commandments, by the way. So God's law, which is holy, righteous, perfect, and good. And he says the commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. See, he's saying that if I thought, I thought if I just followed the rules, I thought if I if I just don't covet, don't lust for anything, then I'd be great and I would have life. I would, I would feel good about myself. I'd feel good about my relationship with God. So don't covet, don't covet, don't covet, don't covet. And guess what he began to do? As he goes on to say, he had coveting, every kind of covetous desire. He wanted so-and-so's camels and so-and-so's sandals and so-and-so's tent and so-and-so's wife and so-and-so's dog. I mean, he wanted everything. He had every kind of covetous desire because he says, the law, it doesn't provide life. Instead, sin uses the law to put me to death. And so when we we fall back only to our authority and try to control these kids through these rules, we will end up killing them. Either again, with rebellion, when they've given up on this conditional love, or maybe even worse, they grow up as an adult thinking now they got to earn it. So when they make a mistake, now they think everyone is going to hate them. Their friends are going to leave them. And God's probably not pleased with them. And so how can they ever be okay? And so they're going to struggle mightily. And so instead, as parents, what we're trying to do is we're trying to earn their trust. We're trying to earn the right to influence in them. To, and, and when we do that, now we have their confidence and now they're going to trust our authority. Now they're going to listen to us. And that's what Paul was talking about in, in verse four of Ephesians six, where he talks about not provoking your children to anger. Again, going back to the curing parents, I loved how they put it. They said this early on. They said, because God's primary goal is earning my trust. And that that surprised me. I remember reading that, that God's primary goal is trying to earn my trust. And I remember reading that thinking, that's not true. He's already proven that he's trustworthy. He, He went to the cross and he died for me. Clearly he's trustworthy. But the reality is I don't trust him. Not all the time. If I did, I would be living perfectly, but I don't trust him all the time. And so every day he's earning my trust. And so they write, because God's primary goal is earning my trust so he can love me and increasingly mature me, correct my behavior and free my life, I will attempt to offer the same for my child. Isn't that cool? That I get to offer that, that gift now to earn their trust so that they'll trust my love. They'll trust my acceptance. They'll trust my authority. They'll trust that I'm trying to do what's in their best interest. They go on to write, God has endlessly done more than enough to have earned my trust, but he knows until I actually, 
practically trust him, very little he desires from me will come to pass. My lack of trust comes from my fear of trust, not his unworthiness to be trusted. So because he loves me so deeply, he continually reveals himself as trustworthy, breaking down my fears and walls of self-preservation. And as I grow to trust the perfectly trustworthy one, I heal. I mature. I become free. I experience the freedom that he's purchased for us already. It's why David called out, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is saying, what you are able to see him, when you're able to see him, God accurately, and trust his intentions for you, oh boy, what a marvelous life you will have with him. So this has been God's means of maturity all along. And as I begin to understand it for me, it becomes a means for me to help my children mature. Maturity and lasting behavior change do not happen by coercion or technique in my children or in me. I can have very little meaningful impact upon my children until I begin, until they begin to trust my influence. I can give them knowledge. I can offer them information. To some extent, especially when they are younger, I may even be able to leverage their behaviors. But little of that brings meaningful life transforming influence. Until I believe this, I will be tempted to parent by technique-driven formulas to affect something that looks like change in my children. But we have so much more to offer them. So we earn their trust. We earn their trust by being honest. We earn their trust by, uh, by admitting when we failed, when we made mistakes. And we earn their trust when we show them that we're trusting Jesus, that we're coming to Jesus and, and that we're, we're relying upon him as best we know how. All right, one more mistake. And I think this is our last common pitfall. And it's this idea of rudderless parenting, I call it. And, and basically what this is, and it's so easy to fall into the trap. I fall in this trap all the time where, where you're so wrapped up in just putting out the fires of the day, which by the way, sometimes is needed, right? Just be aware that sometimes a parenting win is all the little humans made it to the end of the day alive, right? I mean, that's sometimes a win. Sometimes they can be really trying and testing or you've had a really difficult day. And so the fact that they're all alive at the end of the day, good job, well done. You didn't kill anyone. That's that's a win some days. But when that becomes every day, when our our focus is so short-term that we lose sight of the long-term and the long-term goal, we're like a ship without a rudder. And, and what I mean by the, a ship with a rudder, it can't steer. And now it's at the mercy of the waves and the winds and the storms. And it often will now be just, you know, blown ashore in a shipwreck. And so I think this is the case here with parenting is that we don't have some kind of a plan. Where do we want to take these kids? We're going to end up shipwrecking them somewhere along the way. Now, one of the common mistakes I think parents make along these lines then is thinking, well, we just need to have quality time. We're busy schedules and we're, we're, we've got all kinds of things happening. And, and that was more so before lockdown. And it'd be curious to see how busy we get again after lockdown. But we try to schedule these, these quality times with our kids. What we need to understand is you can't schedule or predict quality time. What you need is quantity time. You need enough time hanging out with these kids so that you will eventually stumble into quality time. I've seen this with my kids. I, I try to take them out and run an errand with them or, or go on a special date thinking, okay, now's the time. And you get nothing. And then all of a sudden you're just sitting there one day and, and, and the child kind of plops himself in front of you and you have one of those meaningful conversations possible. And it's great and it's wonderful. I had that this week with one of my kids and I loved it. And it wasn't planned. It was just It just sort of stumbled into it. And what that means is we have to let go of some of the efficiency that we've been trying to control in our lives. I I love how one author put it. He he put it this way. The efficiency is the how of life, how we meet and handle the demands of daily living, how we survive, grow, and create, how we deal with stress, how effective we are in our functional roles and activities. In contrast, love is the why of life, why we are functioning at all. What we want to be efficient for. I cannot specifically define love, 
but I am convinced it is the fundamental energy of the human spirit, the fuel on which we run, the wellspring of our vitality, and grace, which is the flowing creative activity of love itself, is what makes all goodness possible. Love should come first. It should be the beginning of and the reason for everything. Efficiency should be the how love expresses its why. But it gets mixed up so easily. When I was a young parent, I wanted to take good care of my children. Efficiency. Because I cared so much for them. Love. This is the way it should be. But soon I became preoccupied with efficiency. What are my kids eating? Were they getting enough sleep? Would, it be, would we be on time to the carpool? My concerns about efficiency began to eclipse the love that they were meant to serve. Getting to the carpool on time became more important than attending to a small fear or hurt feeling. Too often the report card, the preeminent symbol of childhood efficiency, was more significant than the hopes and fears of the little one who brought it home. Oh dear. So guilty of that, where I'm so wrapped up in, in what life is feeling like and what it's looking like, and I don't see how I'm, I'm, I'm choking the hearts of my children because I got to be on time or it has got to be a certain way. Again, that doesn't mean that you don't teach them to be on time and you don't clean your house and so forth, but don't make efficiency the preeminent over love, over their hearts. All right, so... Let's close then with what our goal is as parents. And, and here's, here's what my, my goal is as, as a parent. Uh, and, and I think it's, it really ought to be all of our goal. And it's this, it's, it's teaching and modeling to our children what it means to know and trust Jesus. First as their savior, and then as their functional source of life each and every day. And so we're, we're modeling it. We're teaching them to, to come to Jesus and to know what Jesus has done to save them and to make this relationship possible between, between God and them. And that's a starting point. That's the, the introduction to our faith, it says in Romans 5. And now we're going to teach them to trust him day in, day out, moment by moment, to trust Jesus as, to be their source of life, to be their source of, of peace, their, their patience. I, I remember one time, when, when Hannah was little and, and uh, walking into the living room and there was Hannah and she was lying on the couch and, and she clearly was in some kind of distress. And so I remember saying, Hannah, are you, are you doing okay? You want to talk about it? And she goes, no, I'm just talking to Jesus about it. And my eyes lit up and I'm like, okay, all right. Did a 180, walked out of the room as quickly and quietly as I could, not to interrupt it. And I thought, you know, I've screwed up a lot as a parent. But I got this one right. I got that part right. That moment was right. And again, I, I screwed up, you know, minutes later. So far from perfect in any way. But, but what I want to teach my kids is run to Jesus. What is Jesus saying to you about this? Are you struggling with something? Let's talk to Jesus. Let's pray to Jesus. And, and so we're modeling that as parents, Joy and, are, Joy and I are, in our own lives, but then encouraging them now to do the same thing. Now, again, do we do it right all the time? No. I, I heard this as an illustration for parenting, and I, I think it's it's brilliant. It's so absolutely true. And, and it's compared to uh, flying. So you think about a pilot. Before he, he, before he ever you know, boards the plane and takes off, he has to file a flight plan. And that flight plan is we're going to leave uh, this airport on this runway, heading at this direction for this long, and then we're going to turn at you know this many degrees, and we're going to travel on this vector for so long, and then we'll turn again, and then we'll approach this, this airport on at this runway, and we'll land at this time. Like every single detail of the, of the flight is laid out and planned. And then they get up into the air, and they fly, and they're off course 90% of the time. 90% of the time, they're off course. They're always making these course corrections because they're not exactly to what the flight plan was. And yet, they always land at the right destination. And that's parenting, right? We're constantly making these course corrections, right? Because we're, we're not always on, right on target, right? We're off course a little bit, and then we come back a bit. But because we have a goal, and because that goal is for them to know Jesus, and to trust Jesus, and to experience life in Jesus, 
to know who they are in him and who he is in them now, because that's my goal. Despite being off course, if I always have that as my goal, I will be able to land the plane, hopefully. Now, it's no guarantee, right? There's no guarantee because I, I can't control them. My goal is not to raise these godly children because I can't be that. I can't guarantee that. They're going to make their choices. All I can do is be a godly parent and encourage them and invite them to make that choice. But it's on them to do. You see, that's true of God. Even God himself can't raise, guarantee godly children. He's a godly, godly God. He's a godly parent. And he's inviting, encouraging us. But there are some who reject him. Some for salvation, sadly. And then there are others who are his children, but they've rejected his offer to trust him in the moment. And that doesn't make God a bad parent. It means that those children who are responsible made bad choices. But again, as a parent, all I can do is offer to them the opportunity to make that choice. So again, as a parent, don't judge your parenting by the outcome. We judge it by the process. Am I trusting Jesus, modeling to them, and inviting them to trust Jesus? That's all I can control. Now it's between them and God to decide what to do. And, and if your children don't yet know Jesus, or, or again, maybe they've gone off the rails, and, and they've, they've walked away from their faith, keep in mind, this story's not over yet. I mean, think about it this way. If, if, uh, if I were to tell you about Saul the Pharisee when he was actively persecuting and, and you know, arresting and, and torturing and killing Christians. If I were to tell you that just wait, because a year from now, he's going to be the greatest apostle. That, that his writings, more than any other writings in the history of the world, his writings will transform this world to lead people to trust Jesus. You would think I was crazy. You would think I'm, I was off my rocker. And yet it was true. Because God was not done with Saul the Pharisee. And we don't know what God's going to do with your children. We don't know yet. And again, he specializes in redemption. So we can pray for them. We can love them. We can earn their trust. And now, earning their trust, we have that influence. And now we can offer them Jesus as a way. And hopefully, they will accept it. But again, that's between them and Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that we can trust you with our kids. That if you could save people like Saul the Pharisee, you, you could save people like Alice Cooper, you could save people like Josh Gordon, you can save our children as well. And, and we pray that you will, you will reach out to them and you will love them and you will, you will make yourself known to them. And hopefully again, that they will take you up on your offer. But Father, I pray that you will show us as parents how we can model that to them, how we can show them. And, and that recognizing these pitfalls that we've, we've fallen into, these traps that we've fallen into in our past and will in our future as well. I pray that we will not beat ourselves up, that we will not condemn ourselves because God, you don't do that. And you know there's no value in doing that. And so instead, Father, I pray that we will trust you, trust you as best we know how, knowing that you love us and knowing that you love our kids even more than we do. In your name we pray, amen.